So, Season 6, Episode 18. We are over halfway through the second-to-last season of Deep Space Nine. And now is when they invent Section 31. <laughs> Something about that really does amuse me. This, I would argue, is one of the single biggest examples of, uh, honestly, one of the single biggest elements that Deep Space Nine has added to the overall Star Trek mythos. This is one of those changes everything uh, retcons, retroactive continuity, uh, which we've talked about several different types of in the past. This is a, oh, it was always there, you just didn't know it kind of a thing. Which, honestly, Star Trek does a lot of that. Uh, this is one of the downsides of backloaded storytelling versus front-loaded storytelling. See, a lot of people, including me and several of my viewers in the comments section, have been commenting here and there about certain episodes, uh, as we've discussed them throughout TNG and throughout Deep Space Nine, through the lens of Section 31 exists. Ergo, some episodes take on a different meaning or make more sense because of the fact that we consider Section 31's presence as being relevant to the episode in question. This actually comes up more than you'd think, really. It's actually funny how many plot holes or inconsistencies that the mere existence of Section 31 helps to fill. However, none of that was intended. There's never been a hint of Section 31 before because they were never invented before. Backloaded storytelling. And just to kind of showcase the variance in what I'm talking about in an immediate fashion, in this episode, they establish that Bashir is, you know, has been up late getting ready for this conference, and he's working really hard, and he's staying up, and he's kind of worn out, but that's okay. And then he gets up and he's exhausted. Because they knew in advance that his sleep schedule was being interrupted before he was then brought up an hour after laying down. That's just mean, by the way. And then forced to go through the events of the episode. They were able to put those pieces there so that we could look back with a new lens because they front-loaded that. Now, that's just with the, within the sake of this one episode, but I'm just giving you a direct comparison between front-loading and back-loading. By the way, thanks to the fact that Enterprise exists, we now know that Section 31 really has been around since forever. They mentioned that in this episode. They mentioned they've been around since Starfleet was formed, which, if you're paying attention, is before the Federation was formed which is consistent with what Enterprise Season 4 shows us, consequently. But uh, I would argue that of all the things Deep Space Nine added to the overall canonicity and mythos of Star Trek, uh, the fleshing out of the, the Cardassian culture, the fleshing out of the Bajoran culture, or the fleshing out of the Ferengi culture, or the fleshing out of the Klingon culture, or, or the Dominion, or the Prophets, or any of that, I would say the single most long-term impacting element Deep Space Nine added to Star Trek was Section 31. You could argue that it's a very controversial choice. Now, what's funny is I've never heard that personally. I'm not doubting that people think that way and that people don't like it. And as always, I would love to hear your thoughts on that. But do me a favor and don't type your comments on that just yet. I want to actually circle back around to that controversial point, like towards the end of the episode, so please forgive me. So, first of all, can I just gush about William Sadler? William Sadler, there's, there's a class of actors and actresses where I don't see them that often. You know, they're not in a lot of stuff that I watch. But every time I see them, it's just, yeah, they're awesome. That's William Sadler for me. Every time I see him, he is just awesome. Did you know he was in Fallout New Vegas? I didn't. I didn't even realize that. Anyways. <clears throat> So he nails it. He manages to portray someone who is matter-of-fact and business-like, someone who's affable, someone who's self-righteously angry, someone who is hardline, professional. He, he managed, it, it's actually, prob it's hard for me to probably explain, he manages several distinct nuanced performances throughout this episode. Now that's important, that's probably why they brought Sadler in to do this, because they needed an actor who had that kind of range, because in character, Sloan has that range. That's what you need from a good agent. Someone who can just flip a switch and behave in a different manner on the fly. Right? Anywho. So, of course, we let's get to the episode proper. Bashir is heading off to a sunny resort to have a medical conference. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I've brought this up before. There are so many times in Deep Space Nine, it's almost a drinking game 
how many times someone goes off to vacation or to Riza or to a conference and they're kidnapped and abducted in, in, en route. And it almost always ends pretty badly for them. There's this nice bit at the beginning of the episode when Sloane, you know, Sloane's having his fake conversation with fake Cisco, and then he comes out and you, you, what? Are, we're not. There's nothing wrong here. There has to be some mistake. There's no leak on Deep Space Nine. And Sloane says, "I hope you're right. I really do." I think that's one of the only honest things Sloane says before the reveal of the veil towards the end of the episode. After all, that is the preferred status, is it not? It would be preferable to find out there is no Dominion Mole. Especially since, and this is just my take on it, I'm pretty sure Sloan has been wanting to recruit Bashir for a while. But they couldn't because he might have been an agent. So they've just been building this case to, to deal with him for some time. You can see how a lot of little tidbits make more sense in hindsight with the inclusion of Section 31. But let's move on. So, of course, they go down and the replicators are disabled, which makes perfect sense. That's extremely logical, credit to where credit is due. But, of course, that means no food. I actually thought about going off on a massive tangent about the cultural, economic, and industrial impact it would have on a society that does not need something like food storage. Because they don't really have food storage in Star Trek. I mean, some races do, but the Federation doesn't. Why would they? Food comes out of the replicator, and then it goes back in when they're done. So, <laughs> why would they need a fridge, or a freezer, or a cupboard, right? Now, obviously, that's that's the norm. There are exceptions to that. I mean, Joseph's Kitchen all the way back in Earth. But you get my idea. It's just fascinating to think about, because it's one of those certain instances where te technology has developed to the point where previous technology is invalidated, but the moment you remove the new tech, they're, it's like if you were to picture it like as a line graph, and here's like just going out and hunting, gathering, and here's like where we're at, and here's Star Trek. You remove this table, and they're like back to here. They're, they're less advanced than a less advanced race because they no longer have access to the critical pillar of the technology. It's just fascinating to think about. Uh, this is, there's actually a whole societal philosophy, theory about it, about the idea of um, a system develops new concepts which then basically add new mandated necessities for that system to continue to exist and then grow. You know, pillars of society kind of a concept. I mean, we have sewers right now. You rewind time about a century and we kind of didn't. Certainly not to the extent that we have now. We don't... Indoor plumbing, you know? That's one of my favorite examples of this. I'm sorry, I'm getting way off topic. It's just fascinating to think about because they kind of address that here. But before I, meant, before I go any further... I want to mention something. They try to push him off balance a couple of times, usually by jarring shifts. Oh God, there's someone coming. Hey, I'm affable and friendly. Oh God, they're coming after you. You're going to tell me the truth. We're going to defend you. If you're paying attention, and this is fascinating because this is all very well constructed, they go back and forth between varying emotional impacts. They specifically try, are trying to provoke specific emotional responses both good and bad. In short, if this was a video game, I would say this is very well paced, because the tone keeps shifting between, oh, okay, oh, oh okay, oh, and it just kind of keeps going back and forth between that throughout the course of the episode as they're pushing him. What's also fascinating is if you pay attention, they hit a couple of specific points. For example, you were approached, and when they first approach him, he, he plays good cop. Sloan plays the good cop. And he's affable and he's nice. He just asks a couple of questions about him being captured by the Dominion, which was back in, uh, in Purgatory's Shadow. And then he mentions uh, the genetically engineered people and statistical improbabilities. Excuse me, statistical probabilities. My bad. Got the name wrong. And then he's like, you can go. Uh, they also, he gets tired. He gets kind of worn out. He has no food, by the way. So they're now stressing, stressing his body. I like Sloane's comment about that. An old concept, but a very effective one. <laughs> because, let's be honest, if we are suddenly removed from regular food and regular sleep, we start to break down pretty fast, too. Kind of like those pillars of society I mentioned earlier, actually. If we are in full survival mode, we can go long stretches without food or sleep. 
but we're not. We have normal everyday lives, and by the virtue of being at this more advanced state, we now require it more. I, I told you, I didn't tell you, but I, I'm tying it all together here. This is a really well-constructed episode. Before I move forward, I want to talk about the idea of holodeck quality. One of the things I've always had a private headcanon on is that there's different qualities of holodecks. That some holodecks are just more capable of doing more elaborate and complex equations and thus present presentations to make them more believable. I'm pretty sure any old hollow suite, like one of Quark's, for example, you know, one that you basically just bought or designed yourself, would be capable of doing something like, you know, playing a video game. To, to put it into simplistic terms, like like what Bashir and O'Brien do all the time, right? Or Worf's training exercises, you know, that kind of a thing. But if you want a holodeck to be truly believable, to put the person in there to the point where they, despite being genetically enhanced, do not actually cognate the fact that they're in a holodeck, in my opinion, that would require a more precise, more well-designed, higher quality holodeck. Now... It's to some extent, this, this could be debated in both, multiple directions, but I've always thought that holodeck technology has moved forward over the years, from early TNG to late TNG to DS9 to Voyager. In by Voyager's time, holodecks are actually pretty damned advanced, and we actually see several signs of this throughout Voyager's run. Um, and we even get hints of that based on Voyager's interactions with everyone back home. But here, the reason I posit this is, first of all, it's funny, because they actually use Voyager's holodeck set for the end of this episode. But more to the point, it would make sense to me that Section 31 would have the very highest quality holodecks to truly put someone into a scenario where they cannot imagine they are not where they are told that they are. Just food for thought. So they drag him off in chains in front of the, 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 the bystanders. I mentioned again, emotional pacing trying to make him think, you know, don't worry, we're going to fix this, we're going to work this out, Cisco's got your back, you know, no worries, we're going to work this out, you know, that kind of, it's tough right now, but hold on to it, kind of a feeling, okay? Then we cut back to the next interrogation. Now, this is fascinating, because here Sloan plays bad cop. Now, usually, for those of you not aware, the good cop, bad cop dynamic is supposed to be done at the same time by different people. But Sloane effortlessly plays both roles to hammer both points to try and once again push Bashir. Now, this is when the episode also gets clever. I will freely admit I thought there was something up, that there might be something up when this episode went live. And I know I'm not the only one. I'm curious if any of you were. Why? Because the episode points out plot holes or things that don't quite make sense in previous episodes. Things that were happening just because plot, basically. But this episode acknowledges those and says, well, that doesn't quite make sense. So what's the logical explanation? Why did they leave the runabout up above the prison back in Inferno's Light? That's a good damned question. We never got an answer to that, if you're remembering. Why is it that Bashir was so insistent on helping the Jem'Hadar and Hippocratic Oath and was fine with doing so despite being disagreed? Why is it, of course, that he decided to keep hidden about his genetic engineering for so long? Why is it that he decided to reach out to the other genetic freaks in... I say freaks. The other genetically enhanced people. The freaks. Let's just call it... We can call us what we are. I mean, them. Totally not a genetic freak. No, I'm a regular freak. Um... <laughs> Because, you know, why did he reach out to them? Why did he allow confidential Starfleet data to go to these people? That's so unusual, right? You could kind of see how these kind of crack a little bit of the believability of the viewer. Now, with the advantage of hindsight, all of this is actually quite clever, but it's mostly an attempt to push Bashir by saying, these are a lot of coincidences, explain them. One of my favorite parts is where Bashir, who by this point, credit to Alexander Siddiq, he's doing a great job in this episode. He's just, he's exhausted, and he's tired, and you know, here, I'll even lean back just like he is. He's just, he's like this, just, oh God. And you can just see this distant look in his eyes. He's just tired of all of this. And he's literally exhausted, and he's starving. Oh, what in the world? And there's this bit where Sloan hammers him. Would you have revealed your genetic heritage, ever? Now, what I like is Bashir's response. I don't know. 
You know why I like the response? Because it's honest. If he'd said yes, well, he's probably fooling himself. If he said no, then he's underselling his own sense of ideology and his perspective on things. Saying I don't know is the truthful answer. He really doesn't know. And it kind of shows there. And you can see how then the next point they hammer is Cisco, while he believes Bashir is truthful, doesn't know if he believes that Bashir is not a Manchurian candidate kind of a situation. Also, just because I feel like pointing it out, this episode is once again a good example of the recurring nature of Season 6 and Season 7. Ignoring the obvious fact that they parallel the episodes Hippocratic Oath, In Purgatory, Shadow by Inferno's Light, and Statistical Probabilities, there's also the fact that they deliberately and specifically reference the Seventh Fleet and the 98 ships that were lost in it. That was something that came up in the first episode of Season 6. They mentioned the fleet of 114 and how they lost most of their ships. In fact, they lost all but 12 of them. Uh, which would be... Uh, that would actually be 102 losses, wouldn't it? But either way, point being... Maybe I'm getting my numbers wrong, but the point being... Little tidbits of recurrence like that are also rather appreciated. Look at my notes here. Um, God, I love William Sadler in this episode. So then, so okay, then they switch to Wayun. Now, this is interesting, and this is something that's very important. I think this is probably one of the biggest takeaways for the character of Bashir in this episode because Wayun makes the argument. The Dominion is going to beat the Federation. The Federation cannot stand against the Dominion. This, if you're paying attention, has been a recurring trend for all of Season 6. The Dominion is winning, the Federation is losing, and nothing has changed that. Even their great victory at Deep Space Nine of the Wormhole still has not altered that course of events. It's just slowed it down. So, Leun and of course by natural consequence Sloan, makes the argument by being willing to change sides and work with us, you, the doctor, are willing to save billions of lives. And you remember statistical probabilities. I brought this up because one of the main points was that Bashir was trying to keep enough people breathing, whereas Sisko wanted them alive. Now that is a very important point in my opinion, because in my opinion... If this episode had happened before statistical probabilities, Bashir would actually still be thinking in that direction. Still be thinking of the tangible rather than the intangible. The idea that it is worth it to try and do what must be done for the greater good. Now, I bring this up because <laughs> Sloan reveals the veil. He's an iron wall who is strangely empathetic and relatable. God, I love his performance. And Bashir, the doctor, starts arguing that Section 31 is wrong. Because, I posit, he has changed his opinion and perspective as a direct consequence of statistical probabilities. If it wasn't for that episode, I think he would agree with this mentality and probably would have just signed up with Section 31. But now, now he's got this idea thing going, the ideology side of things, rather than the pragmatic side of things. Now he's thinking in terms of what is right and wrong, not what is correct and incorrect. Now he looks at this and says, what does this say about us, that we're willing to betray our principles? One of the recurring trends over on Voyager, which was admittedly mishandled, but is nevertheless present, was the idea of whether or not principles are worth maintaining in dire circumstance. I, I think that could have been a great sub-thematic uh, thematic subplot for Voyager if they'd actually done it deliberately. And the best part about that idea, that concept, is that there's no, not really a right answer or a correct answer to it. Instead, it's all going to be about you and what you think about the topic. Is it acceptable, right, good, to compromise your ideals in the face of reality? Or should you adhere to them? Or maybe you should do both. This shift from Bashir from one side to the other is actually a critical part of his character arc, and I think is part of why Bashir is far more engaging of a character from this point on. Not because I disliked Bashir previous to now, but one of the unfortunate realities is that Alexander Siddig, as I've pointed out before, has portrayed his character rather flatly. 
ever since his genetic engineering was revealed. And yet from about this time onwards, he starts to portray a little bit more humanly, a little bit more dynamically. He puts more into his performance. And I think this is one of the reasons why. Because the focus has shifted from what he is to what he believes. And that's something an actor could get more behind. But I told you I'd circle back around to that controversial point. One of the big points is that the very concept of Section 31 is completely antithetical to Roddenberry's vision. The very idea that something like Section 31 could even exist is laughable. This is why they've never been referenced before. Because it has been considered inconceivable that they could even exist. It took until late Deep Space Nine, the two seasons where the reins were off, where, 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 where the, the hands were off the reins, so to speak, where the executive producers basically just said, go do whatever. It is now that they finally add this concept to Star Trek as an aggregate. Now, <laughs> obviously, a lot of people have a problem with that. In fact, not too long ago, I was discussing... Uh, I can never think of the end of the episode. Far Beyond the Stars, or Beyond the Farthest Star, or God, I can never think of the end of the episode. It's the Benny episode. Um, I was talking about uh, the ideal of Star Trek, and how that's something worth looking forward to. Because we, we don't really want Star Trek to be realistic, do we? Like, I'm, I'm sure there's some of us that do. I shouldn't say that that way. I can understand the mindset that a lot of people don't want Star Trek to be realistic. Because rally sucks. Right? Believable, sure, but not realistic. We want it to be a future in which we really did better ourselves, where we really did get better as a species. And there's just something to be said about a, show, a lighthearted show about life in space, where we have improved as a species, right? Like that, That's a logical pr perspective to have. So I can see a lot of people who either dislike this because, you know, it's not... Can't, and it's not core to the principles of Roddenberry or because it violates that ideology. Now, hear me out. I don't think it does violate that ideology, and I want to explain why. Now, I can talk about the believable pragmatism of how you need the pragmatic with the ideological. You know, you need praxis, right? You need someone to help you stay grounded. I also talked about this back in that episode, and it's also been a recurring point. I keep bringing up the tangible versus the intangible. You kind of need both to make something actually happen. But that's not the argument I'm going to make, because you've all heard that argument before. No, the argument I'm going to make is that Section 31 has operated for over two centuries and never became corrupt. Think about that. Think about real-life organizations that have existed historically for centuries. This has been a recurring pattern. There have been... I'm sorry, that sentence was badly structured. Across centuries, there have been organizations that are designed to be what Section 31 is for Star Trek in real-life historical context. And they become corrupt. Invariably. Every single time. Like, this goes back to, like, the 200s for a first historical records on organizations and concepts and, and subgroups of great and mighty empires and nations that were designed to be the incorruptible that became corrupted. And yet in Star Trek, Section 31 managed to exist and stay true to the ideology while tempered with pragmatism for two centuries. They have no one to report to. They, they have no one to hold their leash. They are operating completely independently, and they have managed to remain pure for that long. Think about that, because that's damned impressive. That is actually kind of astonishing, and it is my opinion that that stays true to the Star Trek ideal, that even the people who have decided to violate the principles of the Federation, and to throw out the right away the Prime Directive, and to do unpleasant things for a greater good, have still managed to not sink into pettiness, or corruption, or self-destruction, or any of the other things that you could see other organizations doing. These are not the Tal Shiar. Odo's flat out says, you know, it's just like the Tal Shiar of the Obsidian Order. Well, the problem is it isn't, is it? And I think that is what helps Section 31 to really be palatable, even within the ideology of Star Trek. 
right at the end of the episode, uh, Cisco Bashir asks, are we really, as a people, willing to accept violating our principles, you know, because we have to or because of circumstances or what have you? You know what I love is that Cisco's reaction to that, his, his response is, and I quote it down word for word, I wish I had an answer for you. And you're probably thinking, Lord, why are you ending on that point? Because next week is in the pale moonlight. I'll see you next time, guys. Sure.